Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Let us all pray together. Merciful God, thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. And we all sin, Father, and we all need your forgiveness, especially when we come to the table. Thank you also for your word and our prayer is that you will speak to us today, that we will learn something new, that we will be touched, and that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and our minds to receive. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, um, did you hear about the, the husband who was a little housework challenged? I'm not talking about myself, by the way, okay? <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> one day, he decided to wash his sweatshirt. And seconds after he uh, stepped into the laundry room, he shouted to his wife, Honey, what setting do I use on the washing machine? It depends, she shouted back. What does it say on your shirt? And he yelled back, uh, New York Mets. <laughs> uh, maybe you can relate. Um, but let me ask you, um, if your life, right, if your spiritual life, if, if it had to be put through the wash, what setting do you think would be required? Just a light rinse? Or maybe a normal wash? Or would it require a heavy wash with some extra detergent? What would it take for you to, uh, to come clean? to be washed clean from the dirt that soils your soul. To come clean is another uh, way of saying to fess up. To fess up means that you have done something wrong. It's to confess. At first the guy you know, denied that he did anything wrong and, and eventually he fessed up. And that's what coming clean means. It's a way of taking ownership, a way of taking responsibility for your misdeeds. But remember when you were a kid, then coming clean meant something more practical. Before you arrived at the dinner table, your mom or dad would ask, did you wash your hands? And so before you sat down for dinner, you had to make a detour to the sink, and you were coming clean in a real sense, in a more practical sense. Washing your hands is also important in another way, of course. I mean, we're living in uh, an overcrowded and disease-ridden world. Public health experts 
are saying that one of the best disease prevention techniques is also the simplest, and that's good old soap and water, to wash your hands with soap and water as long as you give it the proper attention and time. And I think it's something we all learned during the pandemic. Now, we might think that the emphasis on washing our hands is something new, that it is because of the heightened awareness of contagious diseases. But hand washing before worship is actually an ancient practice. God was asking the same question long before mom was asking it. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? The Lord's hill is Mount Zion. It is where the temple was located. So who can go into the temple, into the sanctuary, and who can stand in that holy, holy place? Who can stand in God's presence? And it says, those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully. So those who are pure in act and thought, those who do right for the right reasons, those who do not worship idols or make false promises, those who do not practice dishonesty and lying, they can stand in God's presence in His holy place. So why is God's place of worship holy? Why do we have to be clean and pure to enter it? The answer is in verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. So He has the right to insist on cleanliness for those who enter the temple courts. And not just ordinary cleanliness, not just physical cleanliness, but also moral cleanliness. You see, the Jewish people were used to coming clean in a physical way. Mikvah, purification, was required of all the Jews before they could enter the temple or participate in major festivals that had to physically come clean. And a mikwa was a large bathtub or a small garden pond like so a person was immersed in the mikva and ritually cleansed before they could enter the temple. But the word clean that is used here in Psalm 24, the Hebrew word naki literally means Innocent. So it means more than physical or ordinary cleanliness. It more specifically means moral cleanliness. And so what it refers to is a pure heart. What it refers to is being spiritually cleansed. And so that is why we have a prayer of confession every Sunday morning as part of our worship service. We confess our sin fairly early on in our liturgy of worship. And what it is, is it's a spiritual hand washing. Now I know that sometimes it can feel like it's just a routine. Something we do out of habit. Sometimes it can be like we're just going through the motions. But that's not helpful, okay? That's not good. And if that's the case, then it doesn't really mean anything. And if that was you this morning, then you need to adjust your attitude. Because when you pray a prayer of confession with integrity, with sincerity, when you approach it soberly and seriously and with humility... In other words, when you put your heart into it, then it becomes an act of spiritual purification. 
then it has the effect of coming clean before God. It's a spiritual way of washing your hands before dinner. Even more so when we're about to sit down together at the Lord's dinner table. And so when we're about to celebrate communion with Jesus and with one another. By the way, that's why the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians that, that they should not approach the Lord's table unworthily. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. And that's why we need to do some self-examination, especially before celebrating the Lord's Supper. To meditate on, on what is going on in our spiritual lives, what is going on in our relationship with God, to acknowledge our sin before our merciful God and have the full intention of amending and changing our lives. Did you know that the Reformed worshippers, what they used to do many years ago in colonial America, they had the practice of issuing community tokens, communion tokens. And the way it worked was that if you wanted to be admitted to the Lord's table, you first had to obtain a bronze or a, a lead token. And that served as your admission ticket to the sacrament. And these tokens were handed out at the close of a lengthy penitential service of preparation for the Lord's Supper. Like on a Friday evening before Communion Sunday, they would come together and worship and be contrite and seek God's forgiveness. And so they were serious about preparing their hearts and lives in order to approach the Lord's table. And so that's why we can take the weekly prayer of confession lightly, to pray in our own hearts, but also as a faith community, and use the shared prayer to admit our wrongdoings, to fess up and to come clean before our holy God. But let me get back to Psalm 24, our passage. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in His holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. It says those who do not worship idols. Now, I'm pretty confident, okay, that, that you don't have an idol in your backyard or in your home that you bow down to and and worship. If you do, then you need to come see me very soon, okay? <clears throat> but the truth is, there are so many other things that get in the way of our worship. So many other distractions that prevent us from, from fully putting God first in our lives. Things like money and comfort and scheduling and priorities and sports and TV and social media and jobs, and on and on. We don't think we worship these things, but if they prevent us from praising the Almighty or giving Him our complete loyalty and worship, then they do become idols. Who may stand in God's holy place? It says only those who, whose hands and hearts are pure who do not worship idols and never tell lies. I don't want to go on a rant, you know, or anything. But something that's really bothering me as a believer in Jesus Christ is that it seems like the truth has become optional in the world we're living in. The truth is being twisted and 
turn in all kinds of shapes and forms to fit what people would like it to be. And people, people in public office just straight out lie with a straight face. And ultimately, I don't believe there's such a thing as your truth and my truth and, and their truth. Maybe your interpretation of the truth, yes, but there's only the truth. And when we twist the truth or ignore the truth to suit our own agendas, we lose our integrity and we live our lives based on lies. And the Bible says, those who do not worship idols and those who never tell lies, they are the ones who can stand in God's holy place. The good news is there's also a gift for those whose approach, or those who do approach the holy places with clean hearts and, and pure, uh, clean hands and pure hearts. Those who worship with, uh, with integrity, they promised a remarkable benefit. Two things will be theirs. It says they will receive God's blessing and they will receive God's vindication. In other words, they will receive God's justification, His absolution. It says in verse 5, they will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God, their Savior. In other words, the Lord will bless them. The Lord will save them. The Lord will declare them innocent and reward them. And listen to what Jesus himself said. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Happy are those who, whose hearts are pure, for they shall see God. So what does it take to come clean? How do you get spiritually purified? What is it that washes our hands and our hearts clean? Well, actually, it has nothing to do with soap and water. And there's really nothing, nothing we can do to justify ourselves. It has nothing to do with us, really. And it has everything to do with Jesus and what He does for us. Because you see, our hands are not clean, but He makes them clean. Our hearts are definitely not pure, but He washes them. Our attention wanders, but with infinite gentleness, He calls us back to Him. And He's the one who makes us clean by the blood he shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And he says, come to me and seek me with all your heart and I will make you clean. And so that's what we do as God's people. We come clean in the name of Jesus. We acknowledge our sins and our misdeeds to Jesus and we let His blood wash them all away. And it's not a heavy wash, it's a gentle and loving cycle. But it will most certainly wash away all the dirt that soils your soul. And this way we can actually enter God's holy place and sit down today at the Lord's table with clean hands and a pure heart and celebrate God's love and God's presence with joy this morning. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, we thank you that it's not up to us it's not something we do or can do or can earn. It's all what your son Jesus did for us. When we put our faith and our trust in him and come to you in his name and seek your forgiveness, you wash us clean. 
And the amazing thing is, God, you do not remember our sins. And you do it again when we come to you again. That is the grace and the love we have in the name of your Son. And so thank you for that forgiveness as we come to the table today. We pray it in his name. Amen.